All right, everybody, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back to Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, and tonight, uh, tonight, uh, ding, ding, it's round two. <laughs> round two with Vacha Gotta the Wanderer. So if you were here last week, we read from the Majima Nikaya, uh, the middle length discourses, we read Sutta number 71, and that introduced us to this character, Vachagutta, a, a wanderer, so not a Buddhist, although not for long, <laughs> but <clears throat> not a Buddhist, somebody apparently, we read this last week, somebody that the Buddha has had a lot of discussions with a lot of sort of philosophical discussions. And then last week, the conversation between the Buddha and Vachagotta, well, it was basically about the Buddha or a Buddha, an enlightened, awakened being, being omniscient and like the nature of a Buddha being all-knowing. And so I mentioned last week that there's a lot of these conversations with Vachagutta that are preserved. There's a tiny little collection in the Samyutta Nikaya that has a little grouping of suttas. And the Buddha and this guy Vachagutta, they basically seem to have had a lot of conversations about what we would call metaphysics. Uh, uh, these ideas of sort of like the cosmos and all of that. And so last week it was about the nature of the omniscient mind. Tonight we're diving into, like I said, this is round two of their conversations. And this is going to be sutta number 72, the Agi Vachagutta Sutta. So the teaching to Vachagutta regarding Agi or Agni in Sanskrit, uh, fire. So this is the Tuvachagutta about fire. So that's our sutta for tonight. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, as usual, I don't really have a lot to say before we get into the sutta, because especially since this is coming off of last week, we sort of already know who this guy is, what the deal is. So since it's a it's a there's a few very very important ideas in this teaching let's dive in and kind of get the lay of the land So again this is Sutta 72 the Agi Vachagutta Sutta and it goes a little something like this Uh thus have I heard on one occasion the blessed one was living at Savatthi so we're back down in Savatthi in Jetta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. Then the wanderer, Vachagutta, went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and asked the Blessed One, How is it, Master Gotama? Does Master Gotama hold the view, the world is eternal? And only this is true, and anything else is wrong? The Buddha replied, Vachaha, I do not hold the view, the world is eternal, and that only this is true, anything else is wrong. So, before we kind of go further, we've encountered this idea before, and so let me remind you, we are about to hear again the idea of what are called the 10 unanswered questions of the Buddha. So we did do a sutta, I don't know how many weeks ago, uh, that was sutta number 63 from this collection, was when we really first were introduced to this idea. And these are these famous 10 questions that the Buddha sort of refused to answer. And they are, uh, you again, you could call them metaphysical questions. Um, but as we go through these, I do want to kind of quickly remind you, like, like, what are we talking, like, why, why 
why? <laughs> like who, who cares in this way? So I wanted to kind of remind you. <clears throat> so the first of these questions and Vachagut is saying, so is it true Buddha that you hold the view that the world is eternal? And the Buddha says, no, I do not hold the view that the world is eternal and that that's true. And that's the only thing that's true. Now, really quickly in terms of language, I want to remind you that the word that they're using in this in the Pali is loka. So L-O-K-A, right? So a loka. And that word loka is tricky. It can be translated as a world, but I often like to point out that all these English words that are like location, local, localized, all of those words in English that have loc, L-O-C at the beginning, like local and location, that's coming. Those are remnants of Sanskrit making its way through kind of German and all kinds of crazy things, but making its way into English. And so I think tonight we should like think about that idea of local. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, what is, the, what is the question here regarding is the loka eternal? What, what, what are they actually talking about? And I want to kind of remind you from, well, sutta number 63, when we talked about it, my kind of way, the way that I understand this is that, yes, they could be talking about the world by which you and I in modern English would call planet Earth, perhaps. So the world, meaning the planet, that's one way to understand the loka or the loka dahatu. But I actually think that it would probably, if we were going with planet, it would actually probably be more accurate at that point to be talking about the universe. That we're, we're talking about all of creation, so to speak. So that's two possibilities for how to understand loka. The world, meaning the planet, or the universe. And I want to give you kind of one other very important way to be thinking about a, a loka. <clears throat> Weeks ago, when we discussed that other sutta, I was speaking about it in terms of one's subjective experience of of being of of like being a being and the idea or the question is <clears throat> does this experience of of being is it eternal does it does will this go on in some form or another forever meaning again my subjective experience or you could interpret it as, does planet Earth go on forever? Or you could understand it as, does the universe go on forever? That, so those are three possibilities. I would encourage you, of course, to not <clears throat> like choose one, but to actually kind of get into the idea of <clears throat> um, eternality. And that, that question of, so, so is this eternal? <laughs> and at that point, we could be talking about the universe, the world, or my subjective experience of the world. But so is this eternal? So that's the first one. So, hey, Buddha, do you think this is eternal? And that's the only thing that's true? The Buddha says, no, I don't hold that view. Now, before we even dive deeper into the rest of these, I really, really want us to remember, or not remember, but I want us to be thinking about this. This text, this teaching, is at least 
2,000 years old, probably closer to 2,500 years old. And what I want us to be thinking about is how in 2024, we're still not totally clear about whether the universe is eternal. I think that we are pretty, we're, we've decided, I think, that Earth is not eternal. <laughs> Like modern science would tell us that, you know, the sun's going to supernova, swallow the earth. So I think, I don't, I don't think anybody probably thinks the earth is eternal, but the question of the universe, does the universe go on forever and ever and ever and ever? I would say that the jury is still out on that one, that we're not exactly sure about that. And then if we put it more in terms of subjective experience, the jury is definitely out on whether the subjective experience goes on forever or not. Let's jump to question number two. So how then, Master Gotama, does Master Gotama hold the view that the world is not eternal? And that only this is true and anything else is wrong? And the Buddha replies, Vachaha, I do not hold the view that the world is not eternal. Only this is true, everything else is wrong. So this is about it being not eternal, not going on forever and ever and ever. Again, modern science would have us say that the earth is not eternal. But it's a possibility that the universe is not eternal. It's a possibility that subjective experience is not eternal. Does the Buddha hold the view that this is not eternal? And the Buddha says, no, I don't hold that view. Okay. <laughs> How then... So how then does Master Gotama hold the view, or sorry, next up, how is it, Master Gotama, does Master Gotama hold the view that the world is finite and that only this is true and everything else is wrong? Vacha, I do not hold the view that the world is finite and that only this is true and anything else is wrong. So in terms of finite, this is where we would want to be thinking about the universe and asking this provocative question of, does the universe have an edge? <laughs> is there like an end, an end of the universe? And in which case the universe would be finite. Like you could get into a rocket ship and get to the end. Does the Buddha believe that the universe is finite? No, the Buddha says, I do not hold the view that the world, the loka, that this is finite. Next up, how then, Master Gotama, does Master Gotama hold the view that the world is infinite? And that only this is true and everything else is wrong? Vachaha, I do not hold the view that the world is infinite and that only this is true and anything else is wrong. So this would be the, the idea that you could get in your rocket ship and go and you would never reach the end of the universe, that it is infinite. So possibility of the world in that way. The world being kind of eternal or not, and finite or not. And the Buddha doesn't go either way on either of those four or any of those four questions. Now we move on to a different kind of speculative view, but I do want you to know that all of these are re very related. So uh, paragraph seven or section seven, I should say. How is it, Master Gotama? Does Master Gotama hold the view the soul and the body 
are the same and that only this is true and anything else is wrong? And the Buddha replies, Vachaha, I do not hold the view that the soul and the body are the same only, and that only this is true and anything else is wrong. So really quickly, the language of this is about a jiva, a kind of a life force, if you will. The, the language of soul is rather uh, forced in that way, kind of taking a, <clears throat> a very specific Christian idea and kind of cramming it in this, you know, maybe not the right place to cram it. But the jiva is about like the life force energy. And basically, just to kind of make this very simple, what they're talking about is like, is life jiva and the body like coextensive, like the same thing? Because what we want to know about is after the body dies, is there a life? force a jiva that would then kind of separate and have a, a kind of existence on its own and then what we're talking about or what we are alluding to is the idea of reincarnation and the idea that is there a jiva a life force energy that is freed from the body only to be trapped in a new body now that's actually going to be the next question but the first question is are the jiva the life force and the body the same thing and so they're inseparable and the buddha says no i don't hold the view that they're the same thing how then does master gotama hold this view that the soul is one thing and the body another and that only this is true and anything else is wrong? And the Buddha says, Vachaha, I do not hold the view that the soul is one thing and the body another, and that only this is true and everything else is wrong. So, so now we've dealt with sort of ideas of eternality, which is about time, or not eternal. And we've dealt with finitude or infinitude, which is about space. I do want you to notice that these are two different categories, time and space. And now there's the idea of life in time and space. And this question about jiva and sarira, sarira, this idea of the, the relic in that way, the, the body is what I'm talking about. So those are those first six questions. And now we're going to move to the four questions about the Tathagata, about a, well, you know, a Buddha. But tonight we're going to want to really pay attention to this idea of Tathagata, of, of thus come one. So how is it, Master Gotama? Does Master Gotama hold the view that after death, a Tathagata exists and that only this is true and anything else is wrong? And the Buddha replies, Vachaha, I do not hold the view that after death, a Tathagata exists and that only this is true and anything else is wrong. Now, I want us to kind of stay with us that we're talking about uh, the Buddha, a Buddha, uh, this kind of enlightened being. Let's kind of gloss this with that simple idea of an enlightened being. A Tathagata. Does a Tathagata exist after death? Now, this is where all the questions about you know, finitude, infinitude, all are now about an enlightened being. And the Buddha says, I do not hold the view that a Tathagata exists after death. Well, how then does Master Gautama hold this view? That after death, 
a Tathagata does not exist and that only this is true and everything else is wrong? And the Buddha replies, Vachaha, I do not hold the view. Sorry, I do not hold the view. Lost my spot, sorry. That after death, a Tathagata does not exist. Or that a Tathagata does not exist after death. And that that is true and everything else is wrong. So that kind of puts us in a precarious place, right? It's like neither existing after death, not, not ex existing or in that way. And then how then does Vastra Gotama hold the view that after death, a Tathagata both exists and does not exist? And only this is true and everything else is wrong? <laughs> Vachaha. I do not hold the view that after death a Tathagata both exists and does not exist and that only this is true and everything else is wrong. And then the final question, how then? Does Master Gautama hold the view after death a Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist? And only this is true and anything else is wrong. And the Buddha says, Vachaha, I do not hold the view that after death a Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist. And that only this is true and anything else is wrong. Okay. Yeah, and then just a little section 13. Vachaha then says, how is it then, Master Gotama? When Master Gotama is asked each of these 10 questions, he replies, I do not hold that view. What danger does Master Gotama see that he does not take up any of these speculative views? All right, so before we get to that, any questions about the 10 unanswered questions, about those ideas? Because I want to make sure we're all on, like really clear about what's, it, what's being asked or spoken about. Hmm. Noam? Um, could you talk a little bit about the difference between Jiva and Atman? Yeah. So... So the Atman or Atta, right, is this, you know, it's kind of, it's even in a way related to the idea of an atom, <clears throat> like an atom, an atomic particle, but in the, in the old sense of it being the smallest constituent element. My point is, <clears throat> if you're thinking about reincarnation, like if you're thinking in terms of reincarnation, then what you realize or the way that you would think is that, oh, let's just say for the sake of the conversation <clears throat> that I used to be a, a giraffe, like in my prior life. And then I was a great giraffe. And so I got reborn as a human. And then in the next life, maybe I'll be reborn as a giraffe again. The idea here is, is that then this body, this hair, these color eyes, even these human eyes, in fact, this he whole human body isn't the real me. The real me used to be a giraffe, is now a human, will be a giraffe again. In other words, all of the physical characteristics of me, all the physical stuff is uh, what we would call, um, you know, just an accident in that way. It's like not the real me. But my point is, Noam, is that the, the Atta or the Atman is that irreducible aspect of you that 
you can't take anything away from it. Like, you know, strip it of any more characteristics because it already is the essence of, quote, you. And so my point is, is that even life doesn't apply exactly to the Atman. The Atman is is char almost characteristicless in a certain sense. That's not exactly true. And this is, of course, a gross oversimplification of, of Atman theory. But my point is, is that the Atman is what's on the grand journey and is ultimately a kind of a little uh, a wave of the ocean of Brahma. So the Atman is just a, a wave on the ocean of God in the Atman theory. Whereas Jiva is more like the, the pulse vasculatory system, the respiratory system, the kind of vital life force energy that's pumping everything and keeping it all going. That's my basic understanding of the difference between the life force energy, the jiva, which would almost be like the fuel. And then the car is the atma, <clears throat> kind of, sort of. <laughs> this is more interested, though, in this sort of like <clears throat> the, anim the animating force. And it's like, do you need a body to have the animating force? Or does the does the animating force have existence un, unto itself? So I, I think that's that's really helpful. I will try to learn more about both of those, but I think what was confusing me was the translation of Jiva as soul. <clears throat> That seems like a really poor, I mean, it's a poor tra translation for Atman too, because it's kind of <clears throat> imposing another idea on the idea of Atman, but but at least it kind of makes sense for Atman. But for Jiva, I don't see why you would. <clears throat> but yeah, and <laughs> linguistically, Noam, if you wanted to go a little deeper on this, linguistically, what you could do is you could actually start analyzing words like, um, Ajiva, which means like a uh, right livelihood. But remember that livelihood is about eating, keeping the life, the jiva going. And another one, which is the, the prohibition against kind of taking life is against Ajiva. Like, so this is like take, you know, ending life. Mm -hmm. But what I want you to notice or think about is that when the jiva is ended, that's when the Atman gets to go on its journey to a new body. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, Robin. Yeah, no, great question. Hmm? Oh, okay. Thank you. Is the, um, when he's asking his question, when he ends it with, was that only truth and everything else was futile? Does that does that in any way make it so limited that um, it's asking in it in a way that can't be like expansive? I mean, is he narrowing it down and confined in a, in a way? I I hear what you're saying, Robin, and the uh, well, the answer to the real answer to your question is is coming in the sutra itself. But I will mention though that that. That last little part that is tacked onto each of these about, and only this is true and nothing else is true, that's, my understanding is this, that's speaking more to the nature of a drishti, or the nature of a view, which is holding any view sort of implies that this is true and nothing else is true. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a view. It would be a, maybe a theory, <laughs> a possibility, but to actually hold the view is to think that that's right and everything else is wrong. The Buddha is not answering these for a whole other reason. 
And it actually has to do more with the nature of the questions themselves, not just that little um, uh, addition of an only this is true. That's sort of, yeah. All right, let's keep going. Yeah, great questions. Um, cool. So, boom. All of these dittihis. So, the Pali word dittihi, right? Or drishtihi, but dittihi. And these dittihi gattas, a, a speculative view. That's this the language of a ditti gatta, uh, born of the view. So not founded on, you know, direct knowledge or experience, but born of a view, speculative view. <clears throat> and so Vacha's last question was, what, what danger does Master Gotama see that he doesn't take up any of these speculative views? And the Buddha says, Vachaha, the speculative view that the world is eternal is a thicket of views. It's a wilderness of views. It's a contortion of views, a vacillation of views, a fetter of views. It is beset by suffering vexation by despair and by fever and it does not lead to disenchantment to dispassion to cessation to peace to direct knowledge to enlightenment to nibbana so to nirvana that's where we're going tonight that's the focus of the rest of this sutta is the nature of nirvana it's why this is a very important sutta, very important teaching. So the Buddha repeats that, <clears throat> that the speculative view that the world is not eternal, that's a thicket of views, a wilderness of views, a contortion of views, and so on and so on. Um, also, the view that the world is finite is a wilderness of views, a thicket of views, and so on. So all of these speculative views are a thicket of views, a wilderness of views. So what I really kind of actually, it's why I wanted to introduce that idea. And I didn't follow up on it too much, but I, I meant to. And what it was is, is that the, the question about whether the universe is eternal or not, the jury is still out. Whether there's an edge to the universe or not, the jury is still out whether there is such a thing as a kind of a soul or a kind of a life force that's independent of the body or not, the jury's still out on that one. <laughs> so I want you to notice that these are all still considered speculative, like we don't know yet. But let's just take any one of them. Let's just take the idea that the universe is finite that it has an edge. Well, I already mentioned getting in a rocket ship, right? And finding, trying to find the edge of the universe. But what I want you to start noticing is that from the very single idea of the finitude of the universe, that actually can turn into a whole bunch of different views, a, a wilderness of views. Because now, you could have somebody who thinks the world is finite, but somebody else who thinks the world is finite in a different way, and now they can have an argument and ha have a big you know, academic conference about the nature of the universe. But my point is, is that it can lead to all kinds of argument and this and that, ultimately about something that nobody could really know in that kind of way. So the Buddha is saying, yeah, those any kind of speculative views like these, they're they're just a, a trap in a way. But that's not why the Buddha refuses to answer these questions. He's just letting you know if you go down the road of speculative views, you're just going to get trapped. <clears throat> so that brings us over to uh 
All right. So that brings us to the top of 592 in here. And after going through all the different ones, he gets to that very last one about the Tathagata neither existing nor not existing. And then he concludes by saying all of those views are beset by suffering, beset by vexation, by despair and fever, and they don't lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to nirvana. Seeing this danger, Bhatshaha, I don't take up any of these speculative views. Ah, but now Bhatshaha has a great question. He asks in <clears throat> section 15, then does Master Gotama hold any speculative view at all? And the Buddha replies, Bhatshaha. Speculative view is something that the Tathagata has put away. For the Tathagata, Vachaha, has seen this. And as Bhikkhu Bodhi notes, there's this beautiful play of words where the Buddha says, Dittihi, Dittihi Gattaha. I've, I've put away Dittihi Gattaha. And remember, dittahi means a view, like a opinion, but it can also literally mean to see. And so the Buddha says, I have put down dittahi gattaha, speculative views, because the tathagata dittahi evam, like because the tathagata sees this way. So it's not about speculative viewing, directly viewing. And again, vachaha, speculative view, is something that the tathagata has put away. For the tathagata vachaha has seen this. Such is rupa, material form. Such is its origin. Such is its disappearance. Such is Vedana or feelings, such as the origin of Vedana or feelings or sensations, such the disappearance, such as perception, such its origin, such its disappearance, such are samskara or conditioned behaviors or formations in this text, such as their origin, such as their disappearance. Such is consciousness, such is its origin, such its disappearance. Therefore, I say, with the destruction, the fading away, the cessation, the giving up and relinquishing of all conceivings, all excogitations, what a great word, all eye-making, mind making and the underlying tendency to conceit, the Tathagata is liberated through not clinging. Now let's hold off on Vakcha's next provocative question, but allow me to kind of dissect that section really quickly. So this is a really important uh, paragraph. I actually, I can't even stress how important this paragraph is to to our study of early Buddhism. So the, the Buddha says that what he has dittahi, what he has seen, are the five aggregates. So if you didn't catch it, the Buddha was talking about form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness, the five aggregates. And he was talking about how he has seen where they come from and seen them go. Allow me quickly, though, to explain and kind of, uh, you know, or not actually, I don't want to explain so much as interpret in my own way how I understand these texts. But let's start with these aggregates. And I want to walk through these really quickly because it's like, this is, again, super important. So when he's saying that I've seen form, I've seen its origin and I've seen its destruction. 
the way that I understand that, and again, this is the way I understand all of the, at least the early Buddhist path. So I mentioned uh, no, a number of uh, months ago, weeks ago, I don't know when it was, but I, you, I was using it as an example for a while, but I had banged my finger with a hammer and I'd gotten, you know, a black fingernail and it was, you know, black way down at the bottom. And then for six months, I watched as this little black thing grew and my, I watched my fingernail grow. And then I've been, you know, cutting my fingernails because I'm fastidious that way. And so I have observed that fingernail, I've absorbed its its origin, I've observed it growing, and I've observed its destruction, and it's going away. And you know what? None of that was me. I watched it happen. I watched form arise and cease. I watched it come and go. But I didn't identify as that fingernail because I was observing the fingernail. <clears throat> now, if you followed me on that one fingernail, you could do it to the entire body of form. All of it, synapses, you name it, all of it in that way. And the Buddha is saying that what he has seen is the aggregate of form. And he's seen it come and he's seen it go. And he's not it, meaning he's not of form in that way. He's observed sensations. Now, I got to tell you, if you understand the origin and destruction of form, and you are not identifying and attached to that, the rest of these are easy. Because sensations come and go every moment. You're, you are having sensations all the time in that way. So how could you be any particular sensation? You observe sensations arise, sensations cease. We get body pains, but they go away. We get pleasurable feelings of the body. They go away. So all of the sensations are coming and going. And the Buddha has said, I see Vedana, or it's their origin and their destruction in that way. What you're perceiving right now <clears throat> is not what was being perceived two hours ago. Perception and what is being perceived is changing with every single perception, right? But then I actually, I happen to have this, where did it go? <laughs> happen to have that classic gem, right? What do you perceive, right? Is it a young lady turning her head away or is it an old lady with a big nose? You don't know. And so perception is right there changing. And so notice that your sensations are changing, your perception is changing or perception is changing. And then our habits or the habits, the conditioning, the that this is on autopilot, the autonomic blinking and heart beating and lungs breathing, all of this is happening via conditioning. And we may, or there may be the habit of doing one thing, and then that habit might change and you have a new habit, or there is a new habit. So the Buddha has observed conditioned states their origin, and they're going away. And then finally, the fifth aggregate, which is the very state of consciousness that is arising based upon the conditioned response to what is perceived by the senses of the body. <laughs> so that conscious state, the fifth aggregate, it's changing Kashana to Kashana to Kashana, thought moment to thought moment to thought moment. And in a meditative state, you observe even the very thoughts arise and cease in every thought moment. And the Buddha is saying, 
I'm not identifying with any of those five aggregates in that way. He's again, that last, the last few sentences of the big paragraph, therefore I say, with the destruction, fading away, cessation, giving up, and relinquishing of all conceivings, all excogitations, all eye making, all mine making, and the underlying tendency to conceit, the Tathagata is liberated through not clinging. So, anything in there confusing before we move forward? Because that, again, that's a really important part about the relationship with the aggregates. All right. So Vachaha has a question about a bhikkhu. It could be a bhikkhuni, could be a nun as well. But Vacha has a question. When a practitioner or when a practitioner's mind is liberated thus, meaning liberated in the way that you just described, Master Gautama or Master Gautama, where do they reappear after death? The Buddha says the term reappears just doesn't apply, Vachaha. Ah, then the practitioner does not reappear, is, is what you're saying, right? The Buddha replied, the term does not reappear, does not apply, Vachaha. Ah, then the practitioner both appears and doesn't appear, or reappears and doesn't reappear. And you, everybody realizes we're talking about rebirth, right? right? Is reborn. Ah, so they both reappear and do not reappear. The term or the phrase both reappear and does not reappear does not apply, Vachaha. Ah, then the practitioner neither reappears nor does not reappear. The term, or the, uh, the term neither reappears nor does not reappear, does not apply, Vachaha. And now Vachaha is a little confused. And this is one of my favorite parts of this sutra. When Master Gautama is asked these four questions, he replies, the term reappears does not apply. The term does not reappear, does not apply, Vachaha. The term both reappears and does not reappear, does not apply, Vachaha. The term neither reappears nor does not reappear, does not apply, Vachaha. Here I've fallen into bewilderment. Master Gautama, here I've fallen into confusion. And the measure of confidence that I had gained through our previous conversations has now disappeared. And the Buddha replies, yeah, it's enough to cause you bewilderment, Vachaha. It's enough to cause you confusion. Because this Dharma, Vachaha, it's profound. It's hard to see. It's hard to understand. It's peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning, subtle to be experienced by the wise. It's hard for you to understand it when you hold another view, accept another teaching, approve of another teaching, pursue a different training and follow a different teacher. So I shall question you about this in return, Vachaha. Answer however you like. What do you think, Vachaha? Suppose a fire were burning. 
would you know this fire is burning before me? I would, Master Gotama. And if someone were to ask you, Vachaha, what does this fire burning before you burn in dependence upon? Being asked thus, what would you answer? Being asked thus, Master Gotama, I would answer, this fire burns in dependence upon fuel of grass and sticks or wood or whatever. Now, if that fire before you were to be extinguished, would you know this fire before me has been extinguished? I would, Master Gotama. If someone were to ask you, Vachaha, when that fire before you was extinguished, to which direction did it go? To the east? To the west? To the north? To the south? Being asked thus, what would you answer, Vachaha? I would answer, that does not apply, Master Gotama. The fire burned in dependence upon its fuel of grass and sticks. When that's used up, it does not get any more fuel. Being without fuel, it is reckoned as extinguished. So too, Vachaha, the Tathagata has abandoned rupa, that material form by which one describing the Tathagata might describe him. He's cut it off at the root, made it like a palm stump, done away with it so that it is no longer subject to future arising. The Tathagata is liberated from reckoning in terms of material form. Vachaha, he is profound, immeasurable, hard to fathom like the ocean. He reappears? It doesn't apply. He doesn't reappear? It doesn't apply. He both reappears and doesn't reappear? It doesn't apply. And he neither reappears nor does not reappear? It doesn't apply. The Tathagata abandoned that sensation, that vidana or that feeling by which one describing the Tathagata might describe him. He's abandoned that perception by which one describing the Tathagata might describe him. He's abandoned those conditioned formations or samskara by which one describing the Tathagata might describe him. And he's abandoned that very consciousness by which one describing the Tathagata might describe him. He's cut those all off at the root, made them like palm stumps, done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. The Tathagata is liberated from reckoning in terms of consciousness, reckoning in terms of any of the skandhas, Vachaha, the Tathagata, is profound, immeasurable, hard to fathom like the ocean. He reappears, doesn't apply. He doesn't reappear, doesn't apply. He both reappears and doesn't reappear, doesn't apply. And he neither reappears nor doesn't reappear. It doesn't apply. All right, let's pause there because we got to talk about the very, very important uh, simile, I mean, it's where the title of the sutta comes from, right? So this is the simile or analogy of ag Agni or Agi, right, in Pali. This is the fire, the fire burning in reliance upon the fuel. And that really, really great question, which is that when the fire has been put out and it's done, which direction did it go? And the idea of that's just, it's not a question you can ask. 
that's what they mean by it. it doesn't apply. It's like you it doesn't make any sense to ask that question, right? And a lot of you have probably seen my Dharma talk regarding the fist, right? And it's like, oh, look, the fist. Where'd it go? Did it go to the east, the west, the north, the south? Oh, it's not like that. I want to kind of uh, share with you another way of thinking about this. Yeah, because we have plenty of time to wrap up the sutta at the end. But because this is like the most important part of the sutta right now, this um, kind of example of the fire, I want to kind of give you another way to think about that. Uh, make a note real quick about something. So let me give you a little, uh, a little Michael one. This is just, you know, one of my examples in that way, but I've, I've used this example, but I probably haven't done this with it. So this is the example with a twist. So I've used in the past, I've used an example and I use this example for a lot of different things, but it's the example of someone having a kind of um, anxiety, paranoid attack where they become convinced that they are coming to get them. So this is totally delusional. It's just pure anxiety. It's just pure you know, imagination in that way, but it's the idea that they're coming and they're coming soon. Let me ask you a question. That being the case, what I just described, what's the best place to hide? Because, you know, I don't want them to get me. So what do you think the best place to hide is? Notice how even asking that question sets you off in the wrong direction and actually is reinforcing the problem. So searching for the best place to hide is going to perpetuate the delusion that there's a need to hide, right? Everybody get my example of that idea of where the where's the best place to hide, right? Let me ask you another question. This is the twist. Master, how do I get enlightened? Or what's the best way for me to get enlightened? <laughs> it's the same question. It's already the wrong question to be asking in that way. Regarding... Let me back up real quick, but regarding what they said about the Buddha, having relinquished all conceivings, excogitations, all eye-making, all mind-making, so the me and the mind, and any underlying tendency to conceit, but the word conceit is not about being conceited or arrogant. It's actually thinking there's something there to be arrogant about. <laughs> so this is the what they often even translate as the conceit I am <laughs> at all. The Tathagata has done away with those. And that's like the fire example and this is that idea. And by the way, because it doesn't really get mentioned in the sutra explicitly, I want to remind you that the word nibbana or nirvana in Sanskrit, it's a very non-technical term. Nirvana is a very simple term that actually just means blown out like a candle. And the reference, like the kind of overarching reference to that idea of being blown out is this example or this simile of the fire burning in dependence upon its fuel. And when the fuel's gone, 
there's just no more fire. If in case you're not catching it, there's a fuel for selfing. There's a fuel for eye making and mind making. And it's basically greed, anger, and delusion <laughs> in that way. And so this idea that the Buddhas relinquish such eye-making activities in that way. The fuel has been burned up. So there's just no more I. So the question about, okay, so somebody who somebody who understands that, where do they where do they get to be reborn? <laughs> Didn't you hear what I just said? The, the liberated mind is free of the better of self. So the idea of where is the rebirth, it no longer applies in that way. Okay, any questions about the fire example? Any, anything we talked about? All right, let's be sure to finish up the sutta then. So... Uh, I mean, basically, we're right at the end. So uh, once again, at the end of that paragraph, the top paragraph, none of these terms apply to the Tathagata. And when this was said, the wanderer Vachagutta said to the Blessed One, he's, he's blown away. And he says, Master Gotama, Suppose there were a great solitary not far from a village or town, and impermanence wore away its branches and foliage, its bark and sapwood, so that on a later occasion, being divested of branches and foliage, divested of bark and sapwood, it became pure, consisting entirely of heartwood. So too, this discourse, Master Gotama, is divested of branches and foliage, divested of bark and sapwood, and is pure, consisting entirely of dharma heartwood. Ma magnificent, Master Gotama. Magnificent, Master Gotama. Master Gotama has made the dharma clear in many ways, as though he were putting upright what had been turned upside down, revealing what had been hidden showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Gotama for refuge and to the Dharma and the Sangha of Bhikkhus. From today, let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who's gone to him for refuge for life. All right, so that concludes the sutra. Let's see. So once again, let me check all of my notes, but anything come up for anybody? Any questions, comments, or ideas about any of this? Again, a lot of ideas in here, actually. Question about the heartwood, that little, we've seen that phrase before. I will mention really quickly that I myself, like, I don't want to say like that I didn't understand the metaphor of the heartwood because I've seen it before, but this sutra really helped me kind of have a deeper understanding of that. And the reason why I say that is, is that even before, like, so I guess this would have been a couple of weeks ago when I was getting ready for December's Dharma Doors. And so I was reading through these group of uh, Vachagutta suttas, and I got to the second one here. And as I was reading it, and, you know, like a lot of these suttas, I read most of these when I was in college, which is like a long time ago now. Talk about talk about a different, uh, different Michael. But my point is, is that I, you know, I haven't read a lot of these in the last 20 years or so. So in reading this one, I was reading through it. And I, in my mind, I was like, this is an amazing sutra. And in my mind, what I was thinking was, this is amazing because it's just cutting right to it. 
like it's no holds barred they're not beating around the bush they're actually saying all of these ideas so i was already having this feeling that wow this is a very powerful sutra that's really like done away with you know I don't know, just done away with a lot of superfluous stuff and gotten right to the point. And then I got to that that idea that the this is this sutra is stripped of all the foliage, the bark, the sapwood, and it's just the pure core of it. This is just the pure core of the Dharma teachings. Which, by the way, I don't want you like for me, this is the most important thing, probably to take away from the night. It's that really beautiful part where he says to Vachaha, yeah, this, sh this should confuse you because this is not simple. This is hard to understand stuff. And as somebody who has been teaching it for 20 years, it, it, it kind of, I don't know. It's so, um, you know, I know I sit up here kind of every Sunday night, sort of just like, like, saying it as if this stuff is like obvious in that way but i recognize that it's not i recognize that the the normal default mode is to very much believe in a self like deeply and to operate entirely from that place so all of this talk about a tathagata having ended all i making and mind making this is sublime, subtle stuff. And so I say this as an, like an encouragement to anybody out there who is still puzzled by these ideas or still struggles with these ideas. If it were easy, everybody would already be enlightened in that way. And I don't mean that in the Mahayana way. I know everybody is already enlightened, but everybody would have already realized it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Maria. Well, I'm sure you realize why the, the Heartwood stuff is pretty interesting to me. I was glad you were here tonight, by the way. I was <laughs> um, yeah, um, and it's funny because, um, you know, I really go deep and do actual stuff. And someone actually the other day said, oh, you're doing real bonsai, like, as opposed to like, mall side or like you know tourist <laughs> mall side or like whatever like yeah we're really really doing it um but um so that's that's awesome i never sort of really thought about it like that either before so um but the 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 thing that um i was thinking about with regard to the sutra is the the so at first these questions were coming up and I was like, these are all, uh, you know, dependent upon a self, first of all, um, this uh, delusion um, around that. But so is it correct that the, so clinging or desire or like just karmic action in general is the fuel for the fire. Um, and so, um that's kind of what makes it continue but it's like there's two layers here going on it's like there's this discussion about how all of that is a delusion or you know just an idea like this idea of time itself is a construct which is i think part of the reason that these questions don't even make any sense or apply um so what I think is so tricky sometimes about these sutras is it's like it keeps going back and forth between this like delusional way of talking about things. Like if we're talking about action or karma or desire makes it continue, then there's this implication that we're, that time is real, that the time is a real thing. Um, but then there's this other side that we're talking about in the context of the sutra that, you know, that's all self-making or self-made delusion about experience, eye-making stuff. 
So it's just it's so tricky how, and that's, I guess, what you mean about it being really subtle. It keeps going back and forth, um, upiically, I guess. Um, so fascinating. You, Maria, as usual, you actually have added an extra layer of depth and profundity to all of this. And what I mean is, let me kind of, I have, a, I've jotted down a bunch of notes in response to what you said. So let me, this might take a moment. I do want you to remember, and I want everybody to always keep in mind, you know, that, and I know this is tricky, but uh, Dharma doors, at least as of late, we've been focusing on these kind of early teachings from the Pali Canon, what is called like sometimes called the Hinayana. And so a lot of the, you know, these kind of two different ideas, Maria, that you're talking about, that's actually coming from me in a way, from you being exposed to me too much of teaching Hinayana on Sunday nights and then Avatamsaka crazy Mahayana Buddhism on first Tuesday of the month. And, the, and so like, that's another layer of profundity and depth, which is like the history of Buddhism and understanding how the different schools relate, talk about subtle and profound. They're just talking about the teaching of no self, just that teaching. But your question or, or more your comment about time is actually really, really interesting and appropriate. And I mention that because, yeah, I have plenty of time for ancient Buddhist history. So, there's a school, it's a very important uh, school of early Buddhism called the Sarvastivadins. And the Sar Sarvastivadins are a group of early Buddhists. They're definitely considered like a Hinayana group, but they're, they were dominant sort of more in Northern India. They very much influenced what would become Tibetan Buddhism, very Mahayana. They've really influenced Northern uh, Indian Buddhism, Central Asian Buddhism. But the Sarvastivadins are a late early period school. So we're not at Mahayana yet, like around maybe like 100 BC. The Sarvastivadins were like really big around like 200 BC, leading up to the advent of Mahayana. The reason why I mentioned them in response to Maria's comment is the Sarvastivadin, and I keep emphasizing the name of this school, is that they had a very particular belief as a Hinayana school, and it was the view or the, 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 the philosophical opinion that Sarva, that everything exists. And specifically, they had this idea that the entirety of the past exists, the entirety of the present exists, and the future entirely exists. We beings are stuck in time, and so we're like stuck in the present, so to speak. But if you could get a kind of God's eye view of it all. All of time exists. So this is the Sarvastivadin, like all of it exists. And again, if you had your God airplane, you could see all of time. But we are not God airplane, so we are in time. I'm saying this because early Buddhism believes in time. It believes in before, during, now. <laughs> And they believe in a future. And they believe then very much in a certain idea of karma, which is that there's karma that will play out. And there's an idea that now is the playing out of karma from before. And there's a whole Hinayana or early Buddhist philosophy in which there is time. And then there's the Mahayana tradition. And the Mahayana tradition is much more interested in for example, time in a dream. 
How long does a dream last? Does it last the amount of time on your alarm clock? Or does it last as long as the experience feels that it lasts? And Mahayana is like, oh, time's a mental construct. Oh, it's a conditioned experience. It's relative to a bunch of other conditional things. Oh, so it's not really existent. That doesn't undermine Sarvastivada and early Buddhist thinking. It just changes the way we talk about it in terms of being conventionally true because the passage of time is conventionally relatively true. But just like Einstein did to Newton at an absolute total level, time's totally relative. So I, the Einsteinian revolution did to Newtonian absolute time and physics, Mahayana did it to Hinayana. And I, I always use the Newton, the Isaac Newton Einstein example. And this is a really good example because if you want to like fix your car, <laughs> Einsteinian relativity is not going to help you tune your carburetor. Newtonian physics will help you turn your tune your carburetor. Newtonian physics is really good about combustion, energy, all of these ideas. So there's a like a conventional truth that is sort of it works if you think you're a being with a brain and a mind then Hinayana Dharma works really well for brains and emotions. If you want to understand the absolute ultimate reality, that's the Mahayana tradition. So, long, long complicated Ziggy answer, but cool. Yay. Any other questions, comments, or ideas? Hmm. Robin? When uh, earlier on, when he said um, it's sort of that same passage, it's hard for you to understand since you have a different view or creed or belief. And it's sort of like saying, like, maybe like quit having so many answers. If you could just quit immediately going to, you know, your answer and just having the possibility of letting some, something else come in, I guess. Yeah, you um, you commenting on it that way immediately makes me think of the famous uh, Zen Buddhist example of the student's teacup already being full and the Zen master kind of keeps pouring and and there's nothing going in the cup. And the Zen master says, yeah, and your mind's like that. You already have all these ideas. So nothing I'm going to teach you is going to get in there. It's very related that way. To go a, a one kind of level deeper on that, I, we really need to pay attention, especially in terms of like, like uh, Dharma doors, like our, our big giant study of the Dharma on Sunday nights. We really want to be paying attention though to when the Buddha says that line, it's the beautiful play of words, but where he says, speculative view is something that the Tathagatas put away. And that's where he says, I've seen this. This is not a speculative view. And here's some, some tools or here's some ways for you to see it. But the idea here is, is that the Buddha or Buddhism is not a speculative view. In fact, they don't even entertain speculative views in that way. And so the Buddha is definitely not saying, like, you can't understand my speculative view because you have your own speculative view. He's saying you, <laughs> you have your speculative view, but so you're not even able to hear what I'm saying, which is not a speculative view in that way. So. Oh, cool. So like, yeah, don't fill the bowl back up. Keep the bowl empty. Or kind it's, of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, beautiful, beautiful on that. Um, by the way, since there's been a bunch of, uh, or different, uh, little language etymology things, if you didn't know, Agni or Agi, so in Pali, A-G-G-I, in Sanskrit, Agni, 
And if you don't know, another little remnant of Sanskrit in the English language, you, you may be aware that the god of fire is Agni, but that's just the word for fire, but fire is considered like a spirit or a, a god in that way. But interestingly, there's all these, or not all, I suppose, there's a number of little English words such as ignite or an ignatius rock. So the, any word in English with, with the ig, igni, igneous and ignite, the beginning of that word is coming from agni. And that's that kind of remnant, again, of Sanskrit in the English language, which is always interesting to note. Little tidbit at the end. Um, otherwise, yeah, the only other last thing that I'd want to say regarding kind of like Hinayana, Mahayana stuff, we do actually hear a lot in the Mahayana suttas. They love the language of the thicket of views, the wilderness of views, being lost in the wilderness of views. Like Mahayana takes a lot of these little nuggets and then like, spins them into whole giant kind of stories about literally kind of being lost in wildernesses, but they're referencing this idea of like a wilderness of views or a thicket of views. So just a, a lot of interesting little things going on in this sutta. But I think that'll do it for tonight, unless there's any last comments or ideas. Yeah, Maria. Just real quick, isn't there a sutra um, called the Thicket of Views? Oh, um, I mean, it's possible. I, it's very, I feel very like possible. I've, we've heard I've, we've heard that one or talked about it or something somewhere. I feel like there's one called the Thicket of Views. Um, At this point, it's hard to keep track of them all. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but that does remind me. I didn't mention it before. If this has been of interest of you tonight, if this topic, like the idea of speculative views, the idea of the 10 unanswered questions and all of that, I forgot to mention a long time ago. So now like probably even a year or more ago, when we were dealing with the suttas in the connected discourses, the section 15 is this, and this is the connected discourses on without discoverable beginning. And it was, the question was how old is the world? And that was a question that had no discoverable beginning. And so these suttas in this section are very related to these more cosmological speculative views. So again, if you're interested in it, um, but that sutta basically talks again about how the question of like how old doesn't apply. It, it it's a not it's asking the wrong question in that way. So just wanted to point out that there's like a whole world of these kinds of suttas. So all right, everybody, that's it for this one. Uh, like I said, we have one more with Vachagutta. Uh, he has become a lay devotee of the Buddha at the end of this one. Uh, but next Sunday night, we are going to do the Maha Vachagutta Sutta, the great or large sutta. So this will be the third and final installment of the Vachagutta series. Um, and that'll be next Sunday. So stay tuned for that. <laughs>